During the French and Indian War, there were three forts named in honor of John Campbell, the fourth Earl of Loudoun, who was the commander in chief of the British forces in North America uh, during the French and Indian War. One was located in modern day Fort Loudoun, Pennsylvania. One was in Winchester, Virginia, and one is in modern day Tennessee. All three were influential in the war against the French and Indian forces in the West, but only one was viewed by Native Americans as a safe haven and a threat, both during the conflict. Today, I am standing in front of the reconstructed Fort Loudoun, Tennessee, made to look as it did over 250 years ago. Join me as I walk around this beautiful reconstruction, and as I tell the story of the rise and fall of this fort in the eyes of the people of the Cherokee Nation. The Northern Indians never really got along well with the Southern Indians. And at the outbreak of the French and Indian War, um, which is in 1754, of course, the majority of the Northern Indians actually sided with the French. And so a large portion of the Southern Indians then decided to side with the English, with the idea that they would be on opposite sides of the war. Uh, so basically, uh, to build alliances with, mostly it was the Cherokee down south here, um, that were the Southern Indians, to build alliances with the Cherokee and expand their influence into the interior of the wilderness, uh, which was Indian country at the time, uh, the British decided to build a fort um, in what is now modern day Tennessee. Now, the British Crown actually gave money to the governor of Virginia, which was Robert Dinwiddie. And uh, the money was actually supposed to be provided to construct a fort, um, but Din Dinwiddie gave very little of it to that, uh, that cause. He actually spent a lot of the money on the doomed Braddock expedition, which uh, scarred the British efforts against the French and Indians uh, in modern day Pennsylvania, uh, out towards uh, Pittsburgh, or at that time it had been Fort Duquesne. So he didn't give a whole lot of money uh, to actually South Carolina, who was supposed to be in charge of this endeavor of building a fort out here. Um, and he's supposed to give it to Governor James Glenn, but uh, uh, it never really got much uh, for the fort. Now, uh, it was decided to finally build a fort, uh, but it was boosted, but the the fort was going to be built next to an ancient Cherokee uh, village or a town called Tomotley. And actually, um, Tomotley would have been roughly around the area behind me. Uh, and these are buildings, if you look behind me, this is like a, like a mud hut, and this is more of like a summer home over here. Um, but these were the kind of structures that you would have seen at the Cherokee town of Tomotley. So, <laughs> after I walked up that hill, I'm a lot of breath. But anyway, I'm standing on one of the top bastions of the, of the, uh, of the fort. And as you can look out across here, this is the fort that's built on a hill. Now, it was designed by engineer John William Gerald de Braum, and the fort was elaborate for Frontier Fort, being that uh, Braum was actually a uh, um, very skilled uh, engineer when it comes to forts, and then uh, designed a lot of more of elaborate ones on the on the actual coast, on the east coast. Now, the fort it was a diamond shaped. Um, it had four bastions, so this is one of four, one on each corner. Uh, since the fort was built on a hill, two bastions were up on the hill. As you can see, this is one, and then there's another one on that corner over there. And then um, there was two other ones down below. So one on the other side of this wall right here, and then one in the far corner over here. Now each bastion actually contained three cannons. Um, so here is a replica of one of these cannons. As you can see, it's sticking out and ready to fire. Um, now each one of these cannons weighed, rough, weighed roughly around 300 pounds each. There were 12 cannons and they had to lug them over mountains in order to get them here. If you can look in the distance, you can see all the mountains out there that they had to lug over to get to, to this spot. So anyway, they had to lug these cannons the whole way from Charleston, South Carolina, or in that vicinity, and bring them out here to Tennessee with no roads or no nothing. Um, so what they had to do was they had to take the cannons and they had to strap them to pack horses. And uh, in order to strap them to a pack horse, you had to cut, put them sideways. So when the problem was when they were walking between trees, again, there was no roads, 
uh, the cannons would actually catch the trees and tilt one way or the other and uh, catch the tree trunks and tilt one way or the other and then that would shift the saddle and usually break the back of a horse uh, which resulting in the horse being have to be put down so the horses of the pack train uh, could only move six miles a day because they had to watch them very closely and then also um, they were lugging these really really heavy cannons and they were extremely awkward now the walls they were 15 feet tall um, the posts to make up the walls were actually angled out at 15 degrees so if you look behind me here uh, that's actually how the wall was actually laid out it was designed to be slanted outward so it make it harder for an enemy to scale it um, so it was pointed outward and the whole wall all around this is all pointed outward at 15 degrees so on top of having bastions full of these cannons, which were unheard of out here in the back country, uh, on the frontier, of course, um, and then also having the 15 degree slanted out 15 foot walls, pickets made up with uh, you know the pointy sticks there. Uh, not only did they have that, they also had a dry moat, essentially. Um, it was a one yard deep, 10 foot wide ditch. If you can see behind me here, that's the recreation of the ditch and uh, it was planted with honey locust hedges and they actually had a gardener here to take care of these things and uh, if you note um, they are extremely thorny as you can look right there so that made it even harder to try to take this fort you had cannons shooting at you you had the, the hard walls of scale then you had to go through a ditch filled full of freaking locust uh honey locust hedges so natural barbed wire to go through this fort in its entirety was eventually completed actually with a a scandal and some other things that I don't want to go into with in regards to Brom and the commander here um, but despite all that it was completed May 30th 1757 right during the middle of the French and Indian War so behind me is a series of barracks now these barracks um, actually uh, housed uh, roughly around 80 British regulars uh, they were regular soldiers and they lived here at the fort food was mostly supplied by the garrison through hunting fishing and farming they actually had land that they bought from the Indians that are separate from the fort where they could actually farm um, now relations with the Cherokee which lived all around here because it was in the middle of a Cherokee village or a Cherokee town of Tomotley the relations was very good the garrison actually fought alongside the Cherokee as they um, combated hostile Indians um, that attacked Cherokee towns at one point. So trade was open uh, between the two races of people, the Cherokee and the English. Um, I'm actually standing in front of the blacksmith shop. The fort's blacksmith actually fixed guns and knives for both the Europeans and the Native Americans. Um, and uh, it was uh, in this uh, shop right here, one of the many buildings that are here. Um, up to 60 women and children of the families of soldiers lived uh, about the fort, maybe not necessarily in the fort, but they were outside the fort in small cabins and things like that. Um, the women of both the Cherokee uh, and the European descent actually got along real well and they learned from each other uh, how to you know do certain weaving and certain things like that and how to live out here and actually in some cases uh, many of the soldiers actually married Cherokee women and had Cherokee wives. The commander of Fort Loudon was Captain Paul de Murray. Um, he uh, actually attended uh, Cherokee dances and ceremonies and he actually convinced Cherokee warriors to attack the French and French allies during the French and Indian War. Um, he even convinced some Cherokee to join the Forbes expedition in 1758 which was uh, charged with taking Fort Duquesne at what is now modern-day Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania at the Forks of the Ohio and uh, they actually joined up. Some of them did leave before the the, the end of the expedition uh, before they actually a, a, playing the assault Fort Pitt or Fort Duquesne but uh, um, nonetheless they went on the on the expedition uh, thanks to uh, the commandant of Fort Loudon right here so after the Forbes campaign of 1758 which uh, resulted in the capture of Fort Duquesne and forced the French and the uh, the French out of the Ohio which is 
what Braddock was trying to accomplish in 1755 and never actually was able to do it. Um, some Cherokee that fought alongside the British uh, and for the British cause actually was killed down here by white frontiersmen being mistaken for enemy Indians. Um, at the time there was a frustration with Indian attacks and uh, a lot of times frontiersmen just didn't care uh, if you were friendly or you weren't friendly, they just figured you're an Indian and you deserve to be killed, which was uh, extremely racist, but of course, nonetheless, was history. Um, in response to this outrage, um, the Cherokee actually killed frontiersmen in retaliation, according to their traditions. Uh, the murder of people on the frontier by Cherokee warriors created outrage in the leadership of the British government, uh, especially in South Carolina. And back and forth, whites and Indians were killing each other off and on, resulting in the governor of uh, South Carolina actually placing an embargo on the sale of guns and ammo uh, to, the, uh, to the Cherokee. And this resulted in the Cherokee uh, turning to trading to the French or with the French uh, along the Mississippi area because uh, the French mainly held um, Louisiana area, New Orleans, things like that. So they started resulting to, to trading with them. So with the report of the violence by the Cherokee, uh, the South Carolina governor actually planned to march um, forces onto the Cherokee out here in the backcountry and stop the war before it ever started, um, figuring that the Indians were actually going to have a full all-out war on the frontiersmen. As a result, a Cherokee delegation actually met the governor and his force while they were at Fort Prince George, and uh, the idea was is they going to sue for peace. The governor, he demanded that the Cherokee that killed the Europeans be handed over to him for punishment. Um, but the delegation insisted that uh, the request would be hard to fulfill since those Cherokee were actually from another tribe and not within that uh, particular delegation's jurisdiction. Um, not trusting the delegation, the governor arrested 24 of them and uh, actually detained them at uh, Fort Prince George. So uh, after negotiating a peace with another Cherokee leader, uh, the governor actually released some of the high-value Cherokee representatives in that delegation that he captured. But he kept several uh, of the Cherokee captives uh, until the Indians that murdered the various Europeans actually uh, turned over, um, were turned over to the forces at Fort Prince George. At uh, several attempts of negotiation, the Cherokee actually changed leaders. Um, to the, the leader now was going to be this more warlike war chief. Uh, his name was Aconasoda, and Aconasoda um, differed with his predecessor who uh, was trying to sue for peace, and Aconasoda was like, nah, we don't need to do that. We'll just show our, our, our brute force. Um, and so thus he was less diplomatic about things. Now on February the 16th, 1760, Akana Soda actually requested a meeting with the commander at Fort uh, Prince George. And uh, that, of course that was where the captives were being held and he was going to negotiate for the captives. After refusing to release the prisoners, because he didn't have command to do so, um, the fort commander was then shot down and mortally wounded by one of the party of the Cherokee, a murder that was actually planned out by Conesota. And in response to the loss of their commander, um, the force at, Prince, at Fort Prince George executed the remainder of the Cherokee prisoners. So now I'm in a storage facility here in the fort, and you see barrels. Here's uh, sugar, whiskey, black pepper, coffee, bacon, all that stuff. Um, so on March 20th, 1760, in response to the hostilities at Fort Prince George, of course, the commander was killed by a con of soda and all that stuff with the Cherokee. Uh, the Cherokee actually decided to attack this fort, Fort Loudoun, um, in response, because this was the furthest west that the uh, establishment of the uh, Europeans, or in this case, the British was. Um, so at the time, Fort Loudoun was stockpiled with food and supplies uh, to sustain themselves for weeks uh, during a siege. After inflicting considerable damage on the Cherokee with the cannons located at the fort, uh, the Cherokee eventually uh, decided to encircle the fort itself and prepare for a long siege. By June, Captain Demery, um, he uh, lowered the rations to one quart of corn per three men. Uh, they couldn't get out um, to uh, get food, so they were running out of it. Um, desertion was actually among the garrison a problem. Um, 
There was a case on June the 2nd where the Cherokee pretended to abandon the siege around the fort, uh, but uh, they were warned by a friendly Cherokee, the people in the fort were warned of this. Um, but despite the warning, uh, Lieutenant Maurice Anderson, the fort surgeon, and another soldier ran from the fort. They both were killed within yards of the gate. 50 soldiers rushed out um, to rescue them, but the Cherokee fired on them and forced them to retreat to the fort. By July, Fort Loudon ran out of bread and started surviving on horse meat. Uh, the Indian wives, actually, um, of some of the soldiers were smuggling food to them um, to try to sustain them as best as they could um, because they were their husbands. Um, but it, it, it didn't do as, as uh, the good as what it needed to. They didn't have enough food here. Um, being cut off from supplies and having no hope of aid um, coming from Fort Prince George or the colonies of South Carolina or for Virginia for that matter. Um, on August the 6th, uh, Captain Demery um, called a council of war in which it was uh, determined that uh, they could no longer hold the fort and that they had to surrender it. So now I am inside the armory of the fort. Um, they have several things here. Here's uh, uh, flintlock muskets. Uh, grape shot, match, guns for the Indians that they were trading with, swan shot, cannon, cartridges, um, iron shot, musket balls, um, musket cartridges. This was where they would have musket flints, by the way, that was important. Um, but uh, uh, this is where they stored all of their war material um, to keep it dry and safe, of course. Now, uh, in her story with the with uh, the surrender of Fort Loudon, um, March the sixth, the meeting was called, um, and they decided to uh, surrender the fort. A meeting was called with the Conesota, who was the lead uh, chief, uh, war chief that was leading the siege, and it was agreed that the fort, its cannons, and its gunpowder um, would be turned over to the Cherokee, um, and the soldiers would be able to leave with their personal arms and their personal baggage, unmolested and under escort by uh, Cherokee warriors. But before leaving, in violation of the agreement with the Cherokee, the garrison actually buried the gunpowder, um, which ruined it because it mixed it in with the moist dirt and uh, you couldn't use it anymore. And gunpowder was a uh, valuable thing for the Indians, not only for their guns, but also if they're going to utilize the cannons in which they were supposed to be taking, um, they needed the gunpowder. Um, so that, uh, that violated the agreement. They, they, le they left the gunpowder, I guess you could say. They did leave the gunpowder for them, but they didn't leave it dry, so they actually buried it in the fort. Um, the British flag above the fort was lowered on August the 8th, 1760, and the garrison marched out of the fort towards Fort Prince George the next day. This included uh, the men, the women, and the children, and part of the soldiers, which were part of the soldiers' families, uh, in the retreating party. The defeated garrison uh, camped at the mouth of Cane Creek along the Teleco River. Um, during the night, uh, the Cherokee escorts that were escorting the uh, men away from the fort, um, he, they actually slipped away in the middle of the night. And uh, in the morning of August the 10th, 1760, 700 Cherokee attacked the garrison, killing three officers 23 privates, and three women. Captain Demery was captured and forced to dance and eat dirt before he was executed, brutally. The remainder of the garrison and their families were captured, and then they were later ransomed back to the Europeans over time. After the attack on the garrison of men, women, and children from Fort Loudon here, uh, the British forces actually led attacks into the interior, into the back country, and they burned a dozen Cherokee towns in response to the attack on Fort Loudoun and uh, the garrison. Of course, this was uh, created in an Indian war. Um, Fort Loudoun was burned by the Cherokee to prevent it from being reoccupied, and it was in ruins um, afterwards. The, later on, after the uh, successful um, attacks of the Cherokee nation in this area, the Cherokee had to sue for peace in 1761. Shortly after its abandonment, 
the fort fell into disrepair and its cannons were scattered about the land by the Cherokee victors. Over time, the Cherokee town of Tomotley disappeared as European settlers moved west. And in 1970s, uh, there there's archeological excavations that were done and they were conducted on both Fort Loudon and Tomotley, which was, uh, Tomotley the town would have been out this way uh, in this water. And they had to do the excavations before the dam was put in place that would flood this entire area um, surrounding the fort and, and Tomotley with the waters of the Little Tennessee River. To save the site for future uh, education, uh, they actually built this up by 17 feet worth of fill they brought in here and uh, the, lifted above the waters of the newly created Teleco Lake. So Fort Loudon State Park, which by the way is a very beautiful state park and it's not all that far away from the Great Smoky Mountains and Gatlinburg and Dollywood and all that. If you're ever in the area, please come down here and visit this and support the Tennessee State Park system and, what they, and the wonderful work that they do here. By the way, these mountains here I believe are the Great Smoky Mountains. Don't quote me on that. Um, um, but Fort Loudon State Park, they, they rebuilt this lovely reconstruction of Fort Loudon, Tennessee, just so um, they can bring history to the eyes of new generations. Thank you for watching. Again, please, if you're ever in this area down here in Tennessee, come visit this place. It, it is absolutely stunning and beautiful.